Welcome back to the channel. We are here once again today with our 99 Jeep Wrangler, 4 liter 5 speed, also known as the Jeep. If this is your first visit to the channel, I will throw a playlist for this thing right up there for you and also down in the description. And what we are here to do today in this video is do a tune-up on this thing. Now the term tune-up is a pretty old school term and most vehicles today you're not going to need to do many tune-ups on and frankly this one's kind of included in that. But what you're looking at here with a you know, late era 4 liter engine like this is I think that's sequential port fuel injection. It's for sure multi-port fuel injection. It's you know still drive by cable and it still runs a regular old distributor cap and rotor. And there's a somewhat serious chance none of you guys out there have ever seen a distributor before. So a lot of cars went to coil pack ignitions back in the mid 90s. This guy is kind of an old relic because this engine is basically a design that goes back for about 100 years at this point. So what we have is all of our spark plug wires go into a cap and then inside the cap there's a little whirly guy called a rotor and that's actually what controls which cylinder fires when. And since those are mechanical parts that actually whirl around and spark inside, they wear out over time. This guy's actually running just fine, but the cap and rotor on it have been on it for about 10 years and probably about 50,000 miles. Those spark plug wires have been on it for about 70,000 miles and since 2005. I think the plugs in it are probably also maybe from 2005. I legitimately don't even remember. So it's just time to kind of get all this stuff out of there and get it freshened up. Normally a tune-up would include any serviceable filters and stuff like that too. We just did an oil change in this thing not too long ago. I've also checked the air filter in it not too long ago, but we'll take a look at it again just to be sure. We'll get to work getting all this stuff done. I'll just take a quick minute to show you some of the stuff off the Jeep because it'll probably be easier to do. These are our cap and rotor. Those are the part numbers. I will link them below for you if I can. I'm pretty sure I got these from Rock Auto. There's a cap. Not wild about the color at all, but it's what we could get with brass contacts in it. So I wanted to buy kind of the nicest parts I could find. You can see all those little contacts inside are all solid brass too. And somewhat to my surprise, it's made my favorite place, USA. Same story on the rotor as far as blue. This was sold as being a brass contact, but you'll see it's actually only brass at the end. So I guess it technically is a brass contact. I don't do enough road caps and rotor jobs to know if this is like a normal thing, but I don't seem to remember them being two materials like that, but maybe. Unable to determine where this guy was made, by the way. Anyway, the whole idea here is this guy sits in your distributor like so, and the cap goes over the top of him. That center post down there connects to the ignition coil, so there's just one instead of like six like there might be on your car if you have a six cylinder with coil packs. This little contact sits on that guy, sits in there like so, and it spins around, it whirls past each of those contacts in the cap, and the spark jumps between them. And then the spark goes off to the spark plug and through the wire and all that good stuff. Really old school. In a lot of older cars, there's a whole lot more stuff going on in the distributor. This thing is basically just a dumb distributor and the computer does all the work. So when we get the cap and rotor off, there's really nothing in there to show you. And on this one, it's a pretty simple job. They've actually given us a couple hex bolts here that we just bolted on and off with and no big deal. Spark plugs and wires, also pretty straightforward. For that job, we're going to use these Autolite Double Platinums because that's what all the Jeep Forum people say to use. And if they suck, spark plugs are easy to change back out. And you can see on the bag here, this plan has been on my mind for a while. The date on this is 6-27-15. So I've had these for uh, over five years ready to go in. And the reason I haven't put these in... Yeah, well, that one's probably broken now. The reason I haven't put these things in before now is because this thing had a pretty badly cracked exhaust manifold. So there just wasn't any sense in putting new plugs in it until that was dealt with. And I'll throw the link to that series up there and down in the description for you. And it's of course in the playlist too. But these are the guys we're going to be using for Spark. And then for wires, we went with NGK because that's pretty much all I could find that I felt was high quality or the highest quality without spending a ton of money. I would guess all this stuff was probably 100 to 150 bucks because I'm trying to buy nice stuff. You can spend less money on this if you want. Probably spend more money too if you tried at it. I think the first thing we're going to do to get started is just get all of our new plugs gapped. These are all supposed to be at 35 thousandths and these are Autolite Double Platinum APP 985s and to gap them I'm going to use this guy just because these are the tools I like. There are many different ways you can gap the plug but I'll show you how to do it with this one and I will also link that in the description for you. The general idea of how these things work is it has numbers around it that tells you the thickness of this thing all the way around and this thing's actually cut at a taper so it gets thicker as you go around. So you stick your spark plug on on the skinny part and you rotate it until it stops and that tells you the gap. Like right now this one's right at 40 so she's a little bit wide. We want it to be you know back here at 35. There are a few ways you can do this. The way I like to do it is just kind of tap them on the ground or on a bench or something. And when I say tap I mean that you don't want to just hammer on them so just like so and we'll check them. And that didn't hardly move it at all so maybe a little more aggressively tap. So doing basically the same thing again it's moving on down. 
a little more tap 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 and after a few attempts we're getting close and I overshot so when you overshot the only thing I do is I actually use this tool as a little pry and be careful because you don't want to break anything in here this little tapered portion of the tool is actually intended for that but usually that doesn't work for me you might try it today just for fun because these plugs are a little different than the ones I normally would work on <laughs> and I went way too far right there we're actually back over where we started from you get the idea how this tool works this is just one I like to use they make fancier ones that work kind of like pliers and those are actually the best ones but they're also kind of expensive so and after way too many attempts because that's how it goes when you record things we're right at 35 so in my case need to do this five more times so I've got our guys all gapped up and another thing I've noticed is that these washers are supposed to go on them you know, a lot of times you'll get plugs that run washers for whatever reason normally they come assembled to the spark plugs and on some of them they were some of them they weren't and what I noticed is there's like a wide washer and a thin washer and I'm not really sure what orientation we should aim for here so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put the wide portion toward the plug for better or worse just so they're all uniform because when I think about like a nut and a bolt that's you know the whole point of a washer is you want the the big one up toward the head of the bolt and I think the plugs that are in it right now are Bosch Platinums because that's normally what I run in most things and if they have this thing too and I can identify which way it should have been I'll update you but I kind of don't think I'll be able to tell so that's how we're going to run them. Our next mission is we're going to pull our plug wires out of the box and make sure these reasonably approximate what's on the thing now. You'll kind of notice a trend here of things I'm doing. I'm checking over all my new parts first before I start taking the old ones off because right now the thing runs. If we start taking parts off we'd have to put old stuff back on if our new stuff was wrong so we don't want to do that if we don't have to. Grab a fistful of plug wires and a packet of lube that fell out on the floor which we won't be using we've got our own. At a glance, I'm noticing good things. There should be two of these angled ones and the rest should be straight. Those all look appropriate for our cap, all good news. Our two angled guys are roughly the same length, which is also good news because they go to one and six and the distributor's right in the middle of the motor, so that should be about right. Yeah, those guys are looking pretty good. And look at that, buying the fancy stuff. They even put stickers on them for us, so apparently NGK is smarter than I am and they're telling me where to put them. So we'll try that and we'll see what happens. I've never had anything but OEM wires have the numbers on them like that, so that's pretty cool. Maybe an NGK guy now from here on out. We'll see. So now we're ready to actually start taking parts off the Jeep. Normally when I do stuff like this, especially in a coil pack ignition car, I will observe my dad's first rule of changing stuff like this that he taught me, you know, way back when, which is if you don't know what you're doing, just do them one at a time, then you can't screw up your firing order, meaning the order in which these are all supposed to be working. And since after the many decades of time that have passed since then, I still don't know what I'm doing, that is typically how I still prefer to do things. If you've got one of these, you've done this a hundred times, you already know where each thing goes and everything else, so you're set and you can just rip all this stuff off and put all new stuff on and you're good to go. With a distributor though, it's a little hard to kind of do them one at a time when we're intending to replace the cap and rotor too. So there's kind of a cheat code for this, and that is to identify our number one spark plug which on this six cylinder in line six, it's just one, two, three, four, five, six. So there's number one. Let's try and fish our wire out of there. Actually, I'm gonna take a quick minute to get this air intake hose out of our way just to make life easy. That's better. So now I've got number one up here behind our AC compressor, which you may or may not have. It routes into this clip right here, so we'll pop it out. And these are Taylor Superstock wires that I ordered from Summit a thousand years ago, and they are gigantic, and they've never actually fit the factory clips very well. So that is why I didn't use them again. But that's our number one position on the cap we have now. Let's go get our new cap. Make sure it looks about the same as far as the bolt pattern. And it does. Even the little vent in it is about the same. And you'll notice on this nice high quality one I've got, they actually already marked cylinder number one for us. Right there. It says number one. And that actually does look like it's going to line up on our actual number one cylinder, which is cool. When you get parts that are labeled like this, it's nice but you should always double verify everything because we have no idea, especially on an older car that is an EFI, somebody could have dropped this distributor in so number one is anywhere and established the firing order off of that. And frankly, it's fine to do that as long as you know it's been done. So don't just blindly toss stuff on here like that without verifying. But that's step one of our cheat code is we need to know where number one is gonna go and fortunately we do. The second part of our cheat code is over here on the intake side of the engine. On most older engines and probably a lot of newer ones, I just don't own any so I don't know, there's normally the firing order for the motor cast right into it. So this one is 153624. So we know where number one on our cap is gonna be. So then the next one in line should be five and then three, then six, two, four. And I'm sure that's what we have right now because it runs just fine. But we'll check so we know which way to start putting the wires on. What I mean when I say that is we don't know if that one's five or if that one's five. And this guy in the middle here goes down to our ignition coil. Which one is five? Not that one. 
Looks like it's going to be this guy. So we go one, five, and then on around with our firing order. On most things, you're usually going to find them, I believe, being clockwise. I think there are some weird stuff, like I think maybe like Oldsmobiles or Buicks and, and of course some marine motors because the whole motor actually runs backward. This won't always be clockwise. So just do a quick visual check here and make sure you know what you're getting into before you start ripping everything on out of there. So we got number one, which is actually marked on our old cap too, which is kind of handy now that I can see it. Number one, number five. So we'll just go right on around with our new stuff when we get there. So at this point, I can just rip all these off the cap. So no real mystery here. Just get them off of there and out of our way. Actually, it might be a good idea for us to just pay attention to a minute to which things are routed over and under. You can just do it so it looks the way you think it will. But usually when these are put together right, they go in a certain way so that there's not a chance of cross arcing through the wires or anything if you have a problem. This one, I think we're just going to put it back together the way it looks nice. Same goes for all of our wire routing clips, just so whatever looks nice. Keep them separate, separated from each other. It's also a good idea to pay attention to which way things go around, stuff like dipsticks and all that. So we've got that all done. We're gonna leave all of our other ends of our wires connected for now. Let's get this cap and rotor off. Looks like we just need a Phillips head for probably both of them. Got a nice long guy here to get a little ways away from my work. That's not one to turn so good. Looks like they are hex on the outside, so I guess we'll try that instead. And our new guy, for whatever reason, these are seven millimeter. Feels like they are on our old guy too. It's such a weird size. Anyway, off they go. These are actually threaded all the way down. On a lot of other stuff, like especially, you know, I know for a fact, small block Chevys, they're just like little hooks and they're spring loaded and you have to push them down and then turn them. I hate those things. I much prefer the full thread, but FYI, there are other ways this is done. Get our cap on out of there. Oh, our rotor looks like garbage. She's all rusty. Cap's not looking awesome either. And the rotor just lifts right off. Usually, not quite that loosely. Our distributor shaft is a little corroded. Like I said earlier, there's really no magic inside the distributor of like, I say a modern EFI distributor car, but about as new as they get. Most of them, you know, there's just a magnetic pickup in here and that's it and the computer does everything else. So nothing in here we need to concern ourselves with. So these are our old guys and these were not high quality parts when I bought them. I remember when I put these on, I was actually chasing after another problem I thought was an ignition problem and it was difficult to diagnose. It actually ended up being a forward O2 if you're curious. So I'm sure these were the cheapest parts they had at AutoZone because I didn't expect to have to repair it right then, didn't have any money. And this rotor is made just like that new one is where these are two pieces, which is strange, but maybe not as strange as I thought it was. But these are not brass. This cap appears to be aluminum and this rotor, I don't know, that might be steel. But the interesting thing is, you know, I haven't been driving the Jeep much, which is why we're doing this, because I'm going to start driving it. But you can see the rotor's actually rusty. Sell the corrosion right on the end of it there. That thing's rusty, which is why we want to buy brass ones when we can, because brass is a better conductor than steel, and brass doesn't rust. It will oxidize up on you. The technically, if, like if this thing did have a run issue, we might be able to sand that and improve things. And it was running, you know, 10 minutes ago. The thing ran just fine. But how complete do you think our combustion is when our ignition system looks like that? Probably not very good good thing to be putting the new parts on the cap doesn't look a whole lot better it's not terrible but you can see where the rotor has been running around those contacts it's got a good bit of wear on it and actually it's hard for you guys to know but that aluminum is all oxidized that's what all that white is and there's actually charring that's what those little like black spots are like, that's probably about a, the best example i can show you with that mark that's on that one down at the bottom there that's actually like charred so this thing's been arcing and sparking and doing all kinds of things that probably aren't good for the health of the vehicle, but it was running just fine. Time to get the new stuff thrown on because this stuff has certainly seen enough use. And this really is one of those deals where installation is just the reverse of disassembly. But one thing I'm going to do that's a little bit maybe weird to some people, and I'm pretty sure I didn't do it before when I replaced this last time, is I'm just going to take a little bit of dielectric tune-up grease, and I do mean a little bit. I've just got a little drop of it on my finger and I'm just going to lubricate this shaft with it. That's what she said. And the only reason I'm doing that is because this had started to rust in there and I would like to slow that down. And the only reason I'm using dielectric grease to do this is if it should happen to sling any out, like as this turns around, if it should spit any into the cap, it really shouldn't hurt anything. So, you know, in theory, this is conductive grease probably a little hard for you guys to see but where the shaft actually goes into that pickup on the outside there's a bunch of rust down there that i actually can't reach to put grease on so i think i'm going to take a q-tip and just kind of wipe some down there to try and slow that down we're just going to take the cap from the lube and just kind of honey dip with a q-tip down in there to get some on there and work it around 
And this is as good of a time as any to mention that this kind of thing is exactly why I think everybody should work on their own cars because this is for sure above and beyond. This isn't anything that is, you know, a required normal kind of maintenance thing. But no mechanic on the planet that's doing this on an hourly rate is going to do this stuff for you when you take your stuff into them. But you can. And, you know, maybe this will make a difference. Maybe it won't. But I keep my stuff forever. I'm not planning to sell this thing uh, in my lifetime. So I want this distributor to be in reasonable condition for the rest of my life, I hope. So taking an extra few minutes to do stuff like this is not a big deal for me. In fact, I think I'm going to take my old rotor here. And you can see the little engagement tang down the bottom of it. Just try and get some grease on it, a little more than I have. So I got a pretty good amount of grease down in that tang now. I'm just going to put it on there and see if I can get that distributed some in the slot. And it looks like it's not working real awesome, but it's doing something at least. New plan, actually cut the head off my Q-tip and put some grease on it. And we'll just get her in there. And again, this is basically a completely unreasonable maintenance thing to do that no professional would do or you should expect them to do and it's not really necessary it's just something i'm doing and you could do it too and what i'm kind of noticing is the shank of the q-tip is actually a little rough i'm actually kind of able to sand some of the rust out of there which is nice that has a light coat of grease on it now so hopefully it won't continue to rust at the rate it has get our new guy slipped on which we absolutely do not want to grease any part of this we don't want grease on our contacts he fits eh, but i guess about the same as the old one maybe a little tighter Dang, it's on there pretty freaking good when it gets on there. Oh, it's making a vacuum, I bet, because of the grease. That's actually fine. Good news as far as I'm concerned. Get our new cap, get him on so the one is pointed in the same way the old one was. Make sure it wants to sit kind of natural-like, which it seems to. It'll be a little spring-loaded because the rotor's actually pushing up on it. We'll just, there we go, nice affirmative lockdown. I've just got a screwdriver to get these started, just because it's easier to do that with one hand, I think. Okay, those are snug. Take our ratchet and give them just a little bit of torque. You totally can crack a cap doing this, so take it easy. And you wanna work side to side just like anything. Don't be a monster. So the next thing is to actually start pulling plugs. And the only one that's really any challenge at all is number one, which you can just barely see the boot for behind the AC compressor. And it looks like it's also gonna end up being quite a challenge to film. But to get that wire out of there, I think I'm just gonna try and stick my index finger under it and pop that boot off. So I can't get in there with any plug wire pliers or anything. That's not one to work out well for us at all. Let's try a different plan. Got a couple of my Egyptian brain picks here for pulling brains through noses, but they work good on cars too, usually for hoses. I'm just gonna try and get him tucked up under that guy and see if I can just like pull it off. And since we're replacing the wires, I really don't care if I hurt them. I do wanna make sure I'm not stabbing something else though. So get him under there. See if we can just pull him out. Nah, he's not thinking that's real funny. All right, then I'm just going to try and stab him and pull him off. There he goes. So I've now destroyed that wire, but it's off. Maybe not the technique you would want to use on yours. Now our wire is out of the way. Yeah, you can see, and I actually do try and keep a pretty clean engine bay. You can see how filthy that is, so it's even hard to get down in there and wash. And there's our stab wound. <laughs> Let's go compare this to the number one on the NGK set. Not quite the same. The boot angle is different, which from what we just saw may or may not hurt us. And the length is a little shorter, which I think is fine. Couldn't tell you which one of these things is right because they're both aftermarket. One thing I did notice on the NGKs that's interesting is they actually silicone the boots to the wires. I've never seen spark plugs like that before. And they only do it on the plug end. On the cap end, they're just shoved in like normal or molded or whatever. That's a little weird. Could be good, could be bad. So that looks like it's going to work at least. So good news, destroying that one didn't hurt us. So now it's time to pull the plug. Should be able to get straight on it here with our comically way too long 3 8 extension. This is about a two foot long guy, just because I can. And this is a 5 8 plug socket, which is what the new ones are. She's not wanting to go in, let's try it that way. She doesn't want to go on. It would be weird if they were a different size. I can almost get a straight shot on it. I wonder if that's our problem. So I had a swivel to the mix, let's see if that helps us. It's like three degrees off of being straight right there. I believe out she's gonna go, and there she is. We'll take a minute when we're done to look all these guys over. At a glance, this looks terrible. I figured they would. And the washes do have the same kind of washer arrangement. It looks like I've got them set up the same way on the new one, so that's cool. I'm going to buzz all these out quick, and I'm going to be mindful to keep them all in order. I also did not realize this. These are the Excel plugs, too. So these plugs have been in this thing for 15 years and like 70 or 80,000 miles. So 
definitely time. So I lied to you guys, I'm going to go ahead and populate that with a plug and we'll probably take them out and refill them as I go and then we'll observe the plugs when we're done. But one thing I am going to do is take some copper anti-seize and just put a little bit on there. This is an iron head, so it's not ultra critical that you do this, but it won't hurt. And in our case, it'll also help hold that washer on so it won't fall off on the way. We wouldn't want that at all. And since I got to put this one in with a swivel, it's going to be a real pain to not cross thread. Hopefully she's nice. I think she is going to be nice. Yeah, I think so. She feels good. I am going to grab a torque wrench, just make sure I don't over or underdo it. The angle will influence this a little bit, but I'm looking for probably about 15 foot bounds, maybe 20. Right there's 15. Okay, that's about 20. I'm going to say that's good. And I'll show you guys a better view of that on a plug that's easier to deal with. But she'd be installed. So here I am down on number three. I'm getting ready to torque it. And regular viewers of the channel have seen this before. But if you're new here, this will be your first time probably. I like to torque spark plugs with what is called a beam wrench. This is a beam wrench. The idea is there's a beam here that deflects. Actually, the, this main beam is the one that deflects. This one stays stationary. And you can watch it walk up the scale. So this is the old school version of the fancy digital ones that will give you a live torque readout. I like to do this because I can see if I'm going to pull threads. So if I get to a certain torque value and I keep turning and the torque isn't going up, I'm stretching something so I should stop. This is more critical and stuff with an aluminum head. This is a cast iron head, so we shouldn't really have a problem. But I just thought I would show you anyway. And I was wrong about the torque values. These are supposed to be 25 to 30 foot pounds. So I went ahead and tightened up all the other ones within that range. I'm actually shooting right at 25 because these are all anti-seize, so they're all oiled thread so the torque values actually need to go down a little because of that anyway the idea here is and i'll probably end up needing two hands to do this ultimately but i'll just show you you start torquing her down you can see that needle reports live for you that is how i like to torque these i'll need one hand to hold down here so i don't crack that plug off and the other hand to actually turn and that is going to look something like this So I've run out of stroke. There's no ratchet on this. There we go. So right back around. It's like 24. There, it just hit 25. So that one's good. That's all there is to it. So we've got all of our new plugs in and we've got all of our old ones laid out here in order one through six. Pretty sure either that or it's one through six. Either way, it doesn't matter too much. They all look like garbage. And that is because they were running way too rich for way too long. Uh, this thing actually had a cracked exhaust manifold on it when I bought it in 2005. And I didn't fix it until like a few months ago. So it's got like 70,000 miles both on these plugs. And probably more than that on a broken exhaust manifold. So that is why these things look like crap. You can see all the soot on them. Also checked all the gaps on them. And they're all oversized by about 10,000. So they're all around 45,000. Which means, you know, about 10,000 worth of material is actually burned off the electrodes you can maybe see that they're visibly thinner right there so that's number one you can see it's nice and black where it was on the bottom presumably probably just a lot of incomplete combustion on these just way too much fuel and you can see that one's super black too same story especially on what was likely oriented on the bottom I think maybe this angle will tell the story a little better you can see they're all just super nastified you know some probably a little worse than others but Certainly a good time to come out. Number six here looks like it's been getting a little hot. That white discoloration back there, and that makes all the sense in the world being that it's the sixth cylinder. But yeah, they all look like garbage, so good news is they're gone. So we've got our new cap and rotor on. We've got all our new plugs in and torqued and anti-seized. And I've got all the new plug wires laid out with their old ones, and I've already compared them all, and they're all close enough to work. I am a little curious about these angled boots on the ends, but we'll see how it goes. And I did already go ahead and install the boot on the coil, just because it's easiest to get to now without all the other ones in the way. So I'm going to start threading spark plug wires in, and I'll catch up with you again when there's something to report. Nearly forgot, we will be using a little bit of dielectric grease on every one of these boots. I'm not going to use this stuff NGK included because I don't know if it's crap or not. I've been using this for decades and it's fine. It's just Permatex. I'll link it in the description. If you never use this, all I do with it is I just put a blob right in the boot like that. And that'll help seal water out of the boot. And on the way down, it'll shove some up in the contact and distribute it nicely. You don't need to use a whole ton. I, I probably use too much right there. But that's the whole idea. And there's what we ended up with. I have no clue if that is truly how it was when it came apart. I sort of doubt it. But it looks tidy and everything's tucked in. Having those way too huge Excel wires stuffed in all the factory clips for so many years has made them a little sloppy. So they kind of want to hop out, but I think they'll be okay. And if they're not, I'll dig up some new ones. That one wire looks like it might be a rubbing on the dipstick, but it's not. There's about a half inch in there. And it didn't even occur to me until 
I'd already done it with the blue wires and the blue cap it actually kind of looks nice uh, they're not quite the same blue on camera it looks more like they are than they are in reality but, but it doesn't look as dumb as i'd feared a blue cap would look because the wires are blue too i don't remember if i did that on purpose probably not and those boots fit just fine those 90s instead of you know the kind of i guess 110s or whatever that were on it so now i think the last thing we're going to do is just pop the lid on our air box and take a look at the air filter i did this pretty recently and it was fine so i'm gonna bet it still is fine but to do a complete tune-up this is part of the job Air filter on this thing is pretty stupidly easy to get to. We have, I think, four clips, but I never put a third one on. I think maybe there's supposed to be one back there because maybe it is a nightmare. I'm not sure. And they're a little stiff, but pretty sure all you guys have done something like this before where you just pop those clips. So I'll get them. We'll look at the filter. And there she is. Yeah, basically not far off a new, except we've got some separation on the gasket. I may have got it pinched in the lid at some point. And that fourth clip I was looking for is actually back on the back of the box right there. Looks pretty good. You can see it's been trying to breathe in the corners a little bit around the filter. So, and this is a Fram filter, which I'm usually not a big fan of, but it'll be okay for now. So I think we're gonna continue to run that for a little bit and she'll be okay. The next thing's gonna be put it all back together, start it up and see what I screwed up. I lied. There is another clip right here that half the time I don't put on because it's a nightmare. I'll try and get it put back on this time. Well, it took 15 years of owning this thing to finally figure out the easy way to get that clip back on. Today was the day. This fuse box is stupidly easy to take off the Jeep, or to pop free anyway. I don't think I'd do it any more often than I have to, just because you shouldn't, and you probably don't want to move it a lot once you do. But once you do get it out of there, just take a screwdriver, stuff it in that clip, and you can pry against the bracket that holds the fuse block in, and just snap her on in. I also did that one first, just made life a little easy. Then to get this guy back on, there are, there's a like a raceway, like a slot cut into the thing in two places. You just have to line these steel tabs up with. The front one's the hard one to get. The rear pretty much just drops in. Once you get them lined up, just give her a push and it should just snap in. A gentle push, I should say. Wiggle, wiggle. Tickle, tickle. There's one. There's the other. Break the pickle. Done. There she is, all buttoned up. I even remembered to take the rag out of there before I put the pipe back on. So let's start it up and see if it backfires and carries on like I screwed something up or see if it runs okay. Well, I'd have to say she's running pretty nice, guys. Uh, at present, the gas that's in this thing is also like 20 months old or 21 months old. It smells terrible and it's almost out. I'm gonna be putting fresh gas in it, of course, before I start driving it. We certainly did no harm here and should be good to go for, let's try and go for more like 30,000 miles next time on plugs and wires and cap and rotor instead of like 80. So as always guys, I appreciate you stopping in for this video and we'll catch you on the next one. I'm Max, that's Saddington Bear, and we make videos like this all the time. Here are a couple links to some other videos we've made and we really appreciate you guys stopping in.